Good morning, people of God, uh, beloved children of God. Welcome to this time of worship with the people of Spirit of Joy. Thank you again for gathering with us wherever you are gathered. Uh, once again, we're grateful. We know that people are gathering literally all across the country. And so if uh, wherever you are, whether you're in town worshiping with us this way or uh, scattered somewhere else, thank you uh, for coming together with God's people. This morning we hear in the lesson for the day uh, that you are children of God. Not because of our righteousness, not because we get things right, uh, not because we're worshiping either in person or via YouTube, but because of God's love for us. And in a world that we've been reminded again is divided and shaken, uh, tired, exhausted, angry, and hopeless. I hope that this good news uh, will speak to you uh, as God speaks to us by God's Spirit. So again, welcome to worship this morning. And we begin with our Easter invocation. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia.
In this Easter season, we give thanks for baptism. It is in baptism that St. Paul reminds us in Romans that we are joined to the death of Christ and also to the resurrection of Christ. And so we celebrate what happens with water and the word of our baptisms. Please join me. Refreshed by the resurrection life we share in Christ, let us give thanks now for the gift of baptism. We thank you, risen Christ, for these waters where you make us new, leading us from death to life and from tears to joy. We bless you, risen Christ, that your spirit comes to us in the grace-filled waters of rebirth, like rains to our thirsting earth, like streams that revive our souls, like cups of cool water shared with strangers. Breathe your peace on your church when we hide in fear. Send us companions on our journey as we share your life. Make us one, risen Christ. Forgive our sins, cleanse our hearts, shower us with life. To you be given all praise with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God now and forever. By the mercy of Almighty God who meets us in the crucified and risen Christ, And the power of the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven, and you are made new. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. Let us pray the prayer for this day. Holy and righteous God, you are the author of life and you adopt us to be your children. Fill us with your words of life that we may live as witnesses to the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please take some time now to share God's peace with any persons you are worshiping with or give someone a call, send someone a text today uh, who would welcome and may need uh, a word of peace from you and from our Lord. The first reading for today is from the first letter of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. God has loved us in order to make us children of God. 
Though we do not yet know the full details of our future existence, we trust that God will reveal it just as God revealed Jesus to take away our sins. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he has revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The gospel for this third Sunday of Easter is in the gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 36b to 48. This is another account of Jesus' appearance to his followers following his resurrection. Jesus stood among them, the disciples, and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them again, why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Dearly beloved, Children of God, grace and peace to you this day from God our Creator and from our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus the Christ. One of the Gospel writer John's favorite themes in his Gospel is what it means to be identified as children of God. He declares in the very first chapter of the Gospel that to all who received him, to all who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. We have many identities, all of us do. Uh, I'm an Isley, I'm a Lutheran, I'm a South Dakotan, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a, I'm a papa. Um, we have lots of identities. 
The one that matters most is this one that we're assigned or we hear of this morning. You are children of God. It's not something you acquire. It's not a group you join by passing some sort of test or initiation or by proving your worthiness. It is an identity gift. And the writer of 1 John echoes that truth in our first lesson for today by stating as straightforwardly as he can, see what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and not just called children of God. That is what we are. The qualifier love, see what love the Father has given us, can mean both quantity, see how much love God has given us, and it also means quality, see what extraordinary love God has given us. Both are packed into this verse. What love God has given us to make us children of God. We are God's children now, John goes on to say, and the entirety of what that means uh, remains a mystery, but it will be revealed to us. And so we're invited to live into the now and at the same time the not yet of our identity given to us by God, God's plan for us. And we do so by trusting that the paperwork for our adoption has been signed, sealed, and delivered. We say we can know that in our baptisms. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. There's no trial period. There's no going back on that promise. This is who we are. Except. Except there are some in the family, some of God's children, who have had their identity stolen. Actually, identity theft is not quite, is not quite the right way to describe it. It's more identity denial. And we've seen its consequences play out again this past week in the shooting of Dante Wright and in the grief and the frustration and the anger and despair that have followed it, especially as this all happened while the Derek Chauvin trial was happening just across town in the Twin Cities. I don't intend to dissect the details of what happened last Sunday in Brooklyn Park, but rather to try and determine where God is in these events and how God's church might respond. First and foremost, it's not just a guess to say that God weeps. God weeps with those who weep. God weeps with those who are so tired and exhausted. God weeps that a child lost his father, a mother lost her son, and a sister lost her brother. God weeps that another young black man has died on our neighbor's city streets. God weeps that a woman living out her calling for 26 years as a police officer made a tra tragic and fatal mistake that she can't take back and now must live with. God weeps that the divisions between people with different skin color demonstrate a disbelief in the truth of the scriptures we hear today, that we are all God's children now. The writer of 1 John, after telling his readers we are God's children, goes on to say, everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that Jesus was revealed to take away lawlessness, to take away sin. And then John goes on to say, no one who abides in him, in Jesus, no one who remains in Jesus, sins. And no one who sins has either seen him or known him. Now, at first glance, this seems 
to contradict our experience. We Lutherans talk about ourselves as both saints and sinners, saved by grace and yet not free of our bondage to sin. So it may seem to contradict what John has just said in previous verses, that we are children of God. Does our admitted sin cancel our new identity, our given God-given identity? By no means. Earlier in 1 John, the author affirms that it is delusional for any of us to say that we are without sin. And we use his words in a prayer of confession. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. That's just not true. And now in these verses, John circles back to say it is also delusional to think that we abide in Christ, that we remain in Christ and continue then and, 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 and go on sinning as if nothing has changed, as if nothing is different. And the sin he's talking about here is not just individual failing. Sometimes we think of sin only as what I have done or failed to do. What he's talking about also means that sin which is about living in and getting comfortable with systems and structures that divide us and separate us from one another and from God. Sin is also any system that denies the truth that every human being is created in the image of God and an equal recipient of God's identity, the identity that we are children of God now. Isabel Wilkerson, in her brilliant book, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents, identifies the structural sin in our country as a caste system. I first heard about caste system as something that uh, is in India, still is in India, a system of the div a division among people according to uh, their birth. You are born into a caste system. And in India, the, the highest caste is, are the Brahmins. Uh, the lowest caste are the Dalits or the untouchables. And there's caste in between. And there's not a thing you can do in your lifetime to change w where you are categorized where you are placed during that lifetime. You can be a Dalit and become a PhD. You're always an, a, an untouchable. Wilkerson makes a compelling argument for the existence of caste in this country based on skin color. She intentionally avoids what she calls the R word, talking about racism, because as she says, racism has come to mean a feeling of, of overt and declared hatred towards a person or group. And what she's talking about is, is more than that. That's a perspective that few of us uh, would own up to. The problem, she says, this, the structural sin that no one abides, no one puts up with who has seen or knows Jesus is this cat system which has turned our divisions into uh, invisible infrastructure and sometimes not so invisible. She compares it to inheriting an old house on a piece of land that is beautiful on the outside, but whose soil is unstable loam and heaving rock, causing cracks and ruptures to appear over decades and even over centuries. Those of us moving into this old house may, say, may rightly say, I had nothing to do with how this all started. I have nothing to do with the sins of the past. My ancestors never attacked indigenous people, never owned slaves. Yes, Wilkerson says, not one of us here was here when this house was built. But here we are the current occupants of a property with stress cracks and bowed walls and fissures in the foundation. And we see the evidence of this every week. Wilkerson's book is full of stories of what, it, what living in this house look like, looks like, especially for African-Americans. Uh, the author is an African-American woman and she has many of her own stories to tell. She has written for the New York Times, taught at Princeton, received the Pulitzer Prize for a previous book. And yet, she says, 
I have lost track of the times that I've answered the front door of my own house in an upscale neighborhood like where our building is. And the person asks me, is the lady of the house in today? Asks me if the lady of the house is in. She tells of boarding a plane and standing by her first class seat. And then she asks the steward for help with her carry-on to lift it into the overhead bin. The steward is looking past her at the men in suits who are standing uh, in line behind her. And then the steward tells her in an annoyed voice, they will help you in the back of the plane. Not recognizing that she is a first-class passenger, of course, because she's been placed in this this container. Cast is, she says, is an artificial container used to separate children of God. An old abolitionist uh, from the 19th century, Senator Charles Sumner said, cast makes distinctions where God makes none. So how do we repair this house? How might the children of God, the people of God, stop abiding in this sin of separation and live more fully into the reality that we should all be called children of God now because that is who we all are? Wilkerson writes that this will require a a, a radical kind of empathy. Empathy is not sympathy. Empathy is not pity. Radical empathy, she writes, is not about, what, about you and what you would think you would do in that situation, a situation you've never been in and perhaps never will. Rather, it means putting in the work to educate oneself and to listen with a humble heart to understand another's experience from their perspective. Laura Cadwell, who wrote an, uh, an opinion piece in the, in the Minneapolis Star Tribune uh, this week, says many of us in the white community have been asking ourselves, so what do we do? What do we do about this? The answer is we can stand as allies with our black brothers and sisters. We can cross artificial boundaries and overcome barriers between us to get to know each other. We can seek out the line at the grocery store that's staffed by someone who doesn't look like us. We can shop where not everybody looks like us, people who are not from our neighborhood, perhaps. We can take our children to a park where black and brown and olive and white-skinned children play. We will make mistakes when we interact. Don't, of course we will. That just means that we go again, we try again. For our part, Spirit of Joy has received some grant money through our created of cult, a culture of calling initiative. Our plans were for in this past, uh, in this season, to host some uh, meals with um, persons in our neighborhood who, ha- who are of different races and religions and backgrounds. Uh, we hope to do that this fall still so that we might be we might develop that kind of radical empathy, those listening skills that Isabel Wilkerson talks about. Stay tuned for more. One more story that uh, Wilkerson tells is of a woman who began to stalk a black man in Georgia when she saw him with two white children. The woman followed Corey Lewis, who was the kid's babysitter, as he drove from a Walmart to a gas station and eventually to his own home. She began following him after he, after he did not permit the woman, who was a perfect stranger, to talk with the children to see if they were all right. Lewis is a youth pastor who runs an after-school program. Once the woman started following him, Lewis started recording, recording the situation on his cell phone. And on the recording, you can see the children in the back seat, calm and unfazed, buckled into their seatbelts. You can also hear Lewis's voice become strained and disbelieving. This lady is following me all because I have two kids in the back seat who don't look like me. The woman called 911. 
She explained what she was seeing. She asked if she should keep following the car. Those answering the call said no, but she kept on following anyway, no doubt with good intentions. By the time Lewis got home, a patrol car had pulled up behind him, an officer getting out, heading toward his car. You can hear a woman off camera exclaim, Jesus, have mercy, what is wrong with this country? The officer addresses the children, a six-year-old boy and a 10-year-old girl, and asks them to step out of the car. Lewis's voice grows more tense on the recording. The outcome of this encounter with the police officer, including his very safety, depends on the response of these two kids. Before they get out of the car, Lewis asked the children simply to tell him who he is. Satisfied that Lewis was indeed the children's babysitter and that the kids were okay, the officer called the parents just to be sure. The children's father told the New York Times later, it just knocked us out of our chairs to get the call. Afterwards, a reporter asked 10-year-old Addison what she would tell the woman who followed them and called the police. Addison said, I would just ask her next time to see us as three children rather than three skin colors. We might have been Mr. Lewis's adopted children or they might have been three siblings, children of God. And that is what they are. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will fully become has not yet been revealed. God is not done with us yet, thankfully. But we can trust that Jesus will lead us into his likeness while shattering the sin that divides us. Amen.
Let us affirm our faith together now in the God who raises the dead and makes us children by love and grace. We use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This morning, part of our worship service that you will not see, uh, part of the service that is happening in person is the celebration of our teens and traffic milestone. As we record this, of course, our teens and parents are not here. Special thanks today to Sergeant Paul Creviston, who uh, is, is leading that milestone. But I do uh, want to invite you to pray for our teens as they uh, begin the process of getting behind the wheel and driving the city streets with us. So please pray with me this prayer that will be on your screen. Dear Lord, having a new responsibility in our lives can sometimes be both exciting and overwhelming. We ask for your guidance as these young adults of our congregation enter a new world of independence. Help them to be wise in their choices and always mindful of others. May your love and care be their guide in the car, in their homes, and in the community. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Alive in the risen Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. Loving God, you make us your sons and daughters simply because you love us. Help us to recognize ourselves in this promise and to see one another as sisters and brothers who are also your children now. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Merciful God, you see how we divide ourselves along artificial lines of race, religion, nationality, and caste. You weep as we put one another in containers of our own construction as we reject your inclusive grace. Bring help and hope to our African-American and Asian-American neighbors who are so tired, angry, and grief-stricken by systems of prejudice and injustice. Show us ways to dismantle what divides us and lead us to reconciliation and peace. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Guiding God, you call your beloved children to a variety of occupations to serve our community. We thank you for firefighters, EMTs, soldiers, members of the National Guard, Highway Patrol, and police officers. Give them wisdom, discernment, and courage to serve and protect us. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. <clears throat> Creating God. Like a master artist, you have fashioned the universe out of your love and delight. Heal your creation where it is in need of restoration. Give favorable weather to those who will soon begin spring planting of crops. Provide all the inhabitants of the earth a peaceful and sustainable home. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of all, the nations hunger and thirst for your righteousness and peace as do many leaders seek power at any price. Bring peace to the suffering people of Mozambique, Myanmar, Afghanistan, Ukraine, Latin America, Palestine, and Israel. Stir your church across the world to lead a charge for peace. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Healing God, 
You hear the cries of those in need and answer them in their distress. Grant to those who are sick and suffering your compassion and nurse them back to health and wholeness, especially Larry, Dean, Theo, Bruce, Terry, Mike, Jordan, Julie, Lisa, Dennis, Jana, Sheila, Peter, Elisa, Marge, Anne, Amy, Rick, Dorothy, Erica, Doris, and others we name in our hearts and with our voices. Be close to the lonely. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Once again, welcome to worship on this third Sunday of Easter. A few announcements. Uh, we are continuing to collect food as we always do before and during the pandemic. And next Sunday will be our monthly Food on the Fourth collection. We have uh, blue bags. Uh, you, some of you may have them or if you happen to come by in person sometime and can pick them up. You don't need one of those to bring a food offering next week, but we'll be receiving food again for uh, our friends at Feeding South Dakota. We're also collecting a Food of the Month peanut butter for uh, other community partners, those who are part of Food to You, are the mobile food pantry. And so if you're out grocery shopping and want to pick up an extra jar or two of peanut butter, drop that off here and we'll make sure that becomes part of the Food to You uh, weekly uh, mobile food pantry work. More information about our preschool is available on our website. Some of you have seen our video. I hope you can catch that. Next Sunday uh, will be a service in which we celebrate God's creation and remember together God's first call to us to care for creation. Uh, bishop Elizabeth Eaton, uh, the presiding bishop of the ELCA, will bring the word, a recorded word, to all of those who are worshiping and here in person, we'll uh, do some things, in, including, weather permitting, concluding our service out in our gardens uh, as we give thanks to God for God's gift of creation and in anticipation of being able to enjoy more time outdoors in the coming weeks and months. There are several more milestones coming up here at Spirit of Joy. Uh, this coming Wednesday, our fourth grade Kids and Money milestone will be happening in our space. Uh, you can find out more about all these milestones on our website. Next Sunday, April 25th, the fifth grade Earth Care milestone will happen between our worship services. And we invite all fifth graders uh, to come and join us for that and uh, participate in this important way to remember, again, God's call, God's first call, and ways we can care for God's creation together. Those are all the announcements at this time. At this time during worship, we usually, usually it's been a while now, but we pass our offering baskets as a way of worshiping with our treasure, with our financial gifts. And again, we invite you today to do that by mailing in a gift if you choose to support Spirit of Joy in this way. And we are grateful for all support we receive from those who are in person and those who are worshiping via YouTube. You can also go to our website again and uh, look for the giving tab and give that way or through our app. We're grateful for all the ways uh, that you support our ongoing ministry with your tithes and offerings. And again this morning, we invite those of you who are worshiping uh, via our recorded worship service to join the people of Spirit of Joy and people around the world in coming to the Lord's table to receive this gift of forgiveness in bread and wine. If you haven't done so already, I invite you to pause uh, the recording now and gather to wherever you are worshiping, whether you're alone or with others, gather some uh, bread or crackers and some grape juice or wine. 
so that you may eat and drink with the people of God in your space. As many of you know now, uh, our invitation here is that someone in your place of worship uh, actually speak out loud the words of institution or the words of promise so that you may hear with your ears in your place of worship the promise of Christ to be present in bread and wine, that this really is Jesus' body and this is Jesus' blood, that he's present with us in these gifts where you are. And then as uh, you serve yourself or choose one person to serve others, speak out loud the words of serving. This is the body of Christ given for you, and this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Before we eat and drink together, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And now may the precious body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you, keep you in God's grace today, this Easter season, and always. Amen. And now receive the Easter benediction. May our glorious God grant you a spirit of wisdom to know, to love, and to serve the risen Christ the God of life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and always. Amen.
Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, alleluia. Go in peace, share the good news, alleluia. Thanks be to God, alleluia.